The date was Wednesday, August 4th, 1943. The world was still at war, and Canadian troops were engaged in the Italian campaign since early July. Back home in Ontario, people followed news from the Italian front and anxiously scanned casualty lists in the daily papers. It was not the best time for a provincial election, and only 52% of eligible voters went to the polls that day to elect the 21st Parliament of Ontario. Though voter turnout was low, the election was significant in the evolution of the role of women in the political fabric of the province. In the Toronto riding of Brackendale, voters elected Margaret Ray Lecoq, while the citizens of York East sent Agnes Campbell MacPhail to Queen's Park. For the first time in the province's history, women would take their place alongside men in the legislature. It was the culmination of a long journey for women to win the right to vote and to run for public office in Ontario. At the point of Confederation, the opportunities that faced women were like those that faced men, really contingent on many different characteristics. So we know, for example, in Canada that Indigenous women were really uh, not enfranchised until the early 1960s. But the, uh, the opportunities that faced women, for example, their access to education, their access to the professions, was often very contingent on the uh, uh, socioeconomic status of their families. Uh, so that, for example, the opportunities that would have faced a woman who came from an upper middle class, perhaps uh, affluent uh, Protestant family here in Toronto, to attend the University of Toronto when it initially opened to women students in the 1880s, those opportunities would have been significantly greater than the opportunities that might have accrued to a woman from a working class background, an agricultural background. Right? So we can't really talk about women as a homogeneous group. We have to talk about the intersections of their uh, class backgrounds, their immigration status, um, and the opportunities that their, their families uh, standing in Ontario society provided them or deprived them of. In the early 1800s, there was no law in Upper Canada against women voting, though by convention, at election time, they mostly stayed at home. In one instance, seven women did vote in the 1844 election, causing the reform candidate in one constituency to lose his seat. To safeguard against it happening again, when the Reform Party regained power in 1849, it passed a motion where it was proclaimed and decreed that no one woman shall have the right to vote at any election. In the 1850s, an African-American abolitionist named Mary Ann Shad Carey made her way to Canada. There, she founded and edited a newspaper known as the Provincial Freeman. Advocating for the abolition of slavery, for temperance, and public education, she also questioned women's role in society. In a front page article dated August 12, 1854, the provincial freeman proclaimed, Then again, some men foolishly deny to women the right to speak in public, to practice medicine, or to vote. Women were explicitly denied the right to vote when the colonies of Upper and Lower Canada New Brunswick and Nova Scotia became the Dominion of Canada in 1867. Under the terms of the British North America Act, only male British subjects 21 years of age who owned a property had the right to vote and hold office provincially and federally. It was not only women who were excluded. Non-British immigrants and Indigenous persons were also denied the franchise. During the second half of the 19th century, the emergence of industrial societies in Europe and America led to the formation of social movements that found their way to Canada as it, too, entered a period of rapid industrialization. Among these movements, an awareness of gender-based discrimination in virtually all aspects of society was starting to emerge. Determined women then began forming associations to advocate for equal rights, which would eventually lead to improved status and better living standards for all women. One such woman was Emily Stowe. When no Canadian medical school would accept her application because of her gender, she enrolled at the New York Medical College for Women. 
Upon her graduation in 1867, she returned to Toronto to become Canada's first female medical doctor. Unhappy with the many restrictions women faced socially and professionally, in 1876, she founded Ontario's first suffragist organization. To avoid provoking controversy, it was known as the Toronto Women's Literary Club. Organizations like the Toronto Women's uh, Literary Club uh, are evocative, really, of a, of a period where women who were committed to their own rights had to effectively keep their preferences somewhat hidden or secret. Um, they didn't call themselves an enfranchisement society or, or a suffrage association uh, because of a sense that the backlash against their ideas would be so vigorous. So these women met as a, as a literary uh, society in private homes. They met on weekday afternoons. And instead of simply discussing uh, novels or fundraising for the local uh, cultural activities, uh, they talked about how to move their own agenda forward. During the six years of its existence, the Literary Club actively educated its members and the public about the many forms of discrimination confronting women. Members of the club were also instrumental in lobbying the Ontario Legislature to pass a law in 1882 that permitted unmarried women with property to vote on municipal bylaws. In 1883, the Literary Club was disbanded and a new organization openly devoted to women's suffrage took its place. Although the ultimate goal of the Toronto Women's Suffrage Association was the franchise, its members also campaigned for better working conditions for women and fought to improve married women's property rights. As a result, in 1884, Ontario granted married women the right to own and manage property without consulting their husbands. That year also saw passage of the Factory Act of 1884, which sought to protect working women and children on the factory floor and to ensure the proper sanitary condition of factories. The Toronto Women's Suffrage Association also persuaded the University of Toronto to accept women students in 1886. It must have been a point of pride for Emily Stowe when her daughter, Augusta, became the first woman to graduate from Victoria Medical College. Like her mother, Dr. Augusta Stowe Gullen would also become devoted to the cause of women's suffrage. When Emily Stowe died in 1903, it was Stowe Gullen who took her mother's place as president of the Dominion Women's Enfranchisement Association. Between 1884 and 1888, over 100 petitions for women's right to vote were presented to town councils and the Ontario Legislature. At Queen's Park, the suffragists had a great ally in John Waters, the member for North Middlesex. Beginning in 1885, he diligently introduced bills for women's enfranchisement in each of nine consecutive years. All were defeated or withdrawn. Anti-suffragists often turned to biblical arguments to deny women the vote. The Honorable John Dryden, the Minister of Agriculture, rose in the House to say, the man was not made for the woman, but the woman for the man. Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Decidedly not biblical, the Bishop of Niagara was quoted in the Globe saying, suffragettes are like rats. They should have the hose turned on them. One fear was that giving women the vote would undermine domestic harmony between husband and wife. Many argued if women had the vote, they wouldn't bother using it. My grandmother didn't get to vote until she was in her 30s. She was born in 1888. And so she never, she never missed an opportunity to vote. She lived well into her 90s and she went to vote at every single election from the time she was allowed. So, um, so that was really ingrained, it was deeply ingrained in me that, um, that it was a that it was a right, but it was a right that we had been denied as women for so long. And because my own grandmother, my own grandmother, um, with whom I was so close, had experienced that, um, I think I, I think I, um, 
I value that. And honestly, I think of my grandmother when I go to vote. You know, it really is, it really is a touchstone for me that she didn't have the opportunity to vote. And then once she got it, she never, ever took it for granted. By the end of 1888, the Toronto Women's Suffrage Association decided they needed to raise public awareness and support for the suffrage cause. In January 1889, they sent 4,000 invitations to the first of four lectures by the American suffragists, Dr. Anna Howard Shaw and Susan B. Anthony. The visiting suffragists helped increase popular support for the cause, and suffragist groups began forming throughout the province. As a result of this renewed enthusiasm, the Dominion Women's Enfranchisement Association, or the DWEA, was formed. With Dr. Stowe as president, local branches of the association were soon formed in cities and towns across Ontario. Another important women's social reform movement of the time also played a pivotal role in the fight for women's rights. The temperance movement advocated mainly for the prohibition of alcohol, believing drink was responsible for many of society's ills. The Ontario chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union or the WCTU, was founded in 1874 by Letitia Yeomans in Owen Sound. Although not initially in favor of women's suffrage, in 1891, a speech by Dr. Anna Howard Shaw prompted the Ontario chapter of the WCTU to join forces with the DWEA to push together for the women's vote. The WCTU hoped that with the women's vote, would come the ability to enshrine prohibition in law. The, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was one of the major women's uh, organizations of uh, uh, sort of early Ontario uh, politics. Lots of my students question what on earth uh, a temperance uh, organization would be doing with what was called the progressive movement of that era. But it was a progressive movement. It was an effort to basically try and ensure that, you know, women and children had, uh, had money for, for food in their homes and for shelter, and that all the family income that came from a male wage earner wasn't frittered away at the local bar. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union is part of a larger capital P progressive movement in the late 19th century, early 20th century, in many major Canadian cities, including Toronto. They wanted pure food and drug laws. They wanted minimum wage laws. They wanted public libraries. They wanted um, uh, public uh, water supplies, better, um, better opportunities uh, for, uh, for employment uh, for young women and girls. So as a result, we can argue that the WCTU was part of an alliance, part of a larger progressive movement that really wanted to in introduce social reform of what would be considered now to be moderate and progressive. Was it uh, very radical. We're not talking about um, socialist and communist political parties here, uh, but we're talking about middle of the road social reform that has historically been very attractive uh, to lots of women voters in Canada. So it was that in 1894, 150 delegates from the DWEA and the WCTU made a joint visit to Premier Oliver Mowat at Queen's Park. Although the Premier expressed sympathy for their cause, no action was taken on his part. In fact, it would be a long decade before any new bills promoting women's suffrage were introduced in the legislature. The suffragists then turned to political theater to get their message across. On the evening of February 18, 1896, Letitia Yeoman's prohibitionists and Emily Stowe's suffragists staged a mock parliament at the Allen Gardens Pavilion in Toronto. It was a glamorous venue that seated 1,800 people. In a full evening of entertainment, the audience was treated to musical performances and served hors d'oeuvres. For the mock parliament, the Ontario legislature was recreated with the parts of the MPPs being played by women as they received a delegation of men humbly petitioning for the right of men to vote. Many well-known Ontario suffragists took part, including Dr. Emily Stowe, her daughter Augusta, and Letitia Yeomans. Mocking the arguments used by the anti-suffragists, they debated, to the pleasure of the crowd, whether men were fit or not for voting. 
it took decades between the first mock parliament at the Allen Gardens and the enfranchisement of women in, in, uh, in Ontario. But the point is that it kept the issue alive and it kept the activists engaged. It was a very long struggle, but I think it did produce uh, important results. It also kept people uh, together uh, with a view um, that they were going to you know, do this collectively, they weren't going to burn out, um, and that they were going to have some fun while they were doing it. Because uh, uh, I think anyone who reads the script of that mock parliament will be aware of the fact that the claim that feminists had, have or had no sense of humor is absolutely groundless. I beg leave to move, seconded by the member for Perry Sound, the first reading, a bill entitled An Act to Prevent Men from Wearing Long Stockings, Knickerbockers, Roundabout Coats when Vice Member for Peel, a bill entitled An Act for the Protection of Dead Voters. The object of this bill is to place on the staff of civic officials in the City of Toronto, especially a duly qualified clairvoyant, whose business is shall Madam Speaker. I beg to give notice that I will move at the next sitting of the House that any member using the House as a sleeping apartment be disqualified. February 13th. Miss Rose, do the government intend introducing a measure to provide for the ringing of a curfew bell at 10 o'clock each evening of the week, warning all men off streets unless accompanied by their wives? I desire to give notice that at the next sitting of this House, I will introduce a bill to remedy the injustice from which the weaker half of humanity suffer, owing to a custom of antiquity by which men, performing the same work as women, and in an equally efficient manner, receive only one half or one third the wage paid to women. Orders of the day. February 13th. Second reading bill, number 48, an act to extend the franchise to men on the same conditions as to women. In 1907, four years after the death of Emily Stowe, the DWEA changed its name to the Canadian Suffrage Association, or CSA. Dr. Augusta Stowe Gullen continued to serve as president of the association until 1911. Another prominent member of the association was Flora MacDonald Dennison. A successful entrepreneur and writer, Dennison also edited a page devoted to women's issues in the Toronto Sunday World. The newspaper was an important source of information and promotion for the suffrage cause. Dennison served as the CSA's president from 1911 to 1914, when she was succeeded by Dr. Margaret Gordon. In March of 1909, along with 14 societies representing lawyers, doctors, teachers, labor, and others, the CSA and the WCTU organized a monster delegation to the Ontario Legislature. Hundreds of women marched to Queen's Park. There, they presented a petition in support of women's suffrage, signed by over 100,000 citizens. As on other occasions, the women were met with sympathy, but left with no promise of action on the part of Premier James Whitney. He would later express his sentiments by saying, Women's suffrage is a matter of evolution, and evolution is only a working out of God's laws. For this reason, we must not attempt to hurry it on. The movement soon gathered more momentum when the National Council of Women formally endorsed women's suffrage. The Canadian chapter of the International Council of Women, it was created in 1893 by Lady Aberdeen, the highly respected wife of the then Governor General of Canada. She was also the president of the International Council of Women when they held their convention in Toronto in June of 1909. For several days that month, slogans such as Canada's daughters should be free, women are half the people, woman, man's equal, and no sex in citizenship were chanted in the streets of Toronto. Women had come to Toronto from America and Europe in a show of solidarity. At one open public meeting, it was unanimously resolved that women ought to possess the vote in all countries where representative governments exist. 
Well, women have come, you know, so far. I remember being in Thunder Bay and talking to a, an organization that was sharing, it was actually from the Finnish community, and they shared with me how it was that Finnish women helped with the women's suffrage movement here in Canada. Because when they had come to Canada, they lost the right to vote. And it was so it was something that they had fought for in Finland, but had lost it by coming to Canada. And I remember how important that was, that as women, they banded together with the labor movement and with others to say that we want this right restored for us and for all other women. So the, the women's movement was definitely a part of our community. It was part of shaping the fabric of this province. Hard fought. And for, for women today, it's for us to, to remember that. And it's important for women to recognize that these rights were not just given, they were earned. While suffragists in Ontario campaigned within the law, British suffragists were often engaged in more radical and sometimes violent protest. The actions of the British suffragettes were followed with a mix of excitement and alarm in Canadian newspapers and periodicals. So when the CSA invited Emmeline Pankhurst and later her daughter Sylvia to give lectures in Ontario, venues like Massey Hall in Toronto were filled to capacity to hear them speak. Though the militancy the British suffragettes often endorsed never took hold in Canada, their passion did inspire Canadian suffragists and positively influenced public opinion. There were activities that suffragists engaged in elsewhere that were certainly more radical, but I think the ideas of some of the Toronto-based feminists were, were quite you know, controversial for the time. Right? Some of them made the moderate argument that we should offer women the right to vote uh, in order to sort of cleanse and purify society so it would be as orderly and tidy as, their, as the private household. There were others, including Flora MacDonald Dennison, who maintained that actually the reason women should have the right to vote was because of pure political justice. And that was a very radical argument. So while the tactics here in Ontario may have been middle of the road, some of the ideas were really quite radical for that time and for our times as well. In the spring of 1913, a monumental suffrage parade was organized to coincide with President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Women from around the world joined their American sisters in Washington, D.C. in a display of international solidarity. Flora MacDonald Dennison brought together a Canadian contingent made up of Ontario suffrage groups that traveled together by train to Washington. Upon being asked what the objects of the parade were, Dennison answered, to give publicity to the movement for the enfranchisement of women, and to make people see that it is a logical movement and appreciate the justice of it. As with John Waters earlier on, the suffragists always had allies in the legislature. Between 1905 and 1916, private members' bills to extend the vote to women were introduced at every parliamentary session. In all, a total of 27 bills were brought forth. Further putting pressure on legislators, Dr. Margaret Gordon and the CSA also rallied 160 town and city councils to petition Queen's Park in support of the women's vote. At first, the bills and petitions were greeted with laughter and ridicule. But as time passed, they began to foster more serious debate. In the end, though, it would be events in Europe that pushed the issue to the top of the government's agenda. It would take the First World War to finally break down the government's opposition to women's suffrage. World War I serves as an important breakthrough, but of course it comes after periods of urbanization, industrialization, pressures by women's organizations to gain the right to vote and to um, access public office, uh, to try and influence public policy. This has been a long time in coming, but certainly World War I offers an opportunity for a government to, to not only take um, the votes of women and, and hope to win re-election, but also to some extent to quiet some critics who've been vigorously 
uh, pressing for these rights and have had sympathetic earrings, but no, hearings, but no support for their actual claim. Women's roles in society underwent profound changes during the war years. Many women left their established place in the home to take on work traditionally done by men who had enlisted. Responding to a patriotic call to arms, women also enlisted in the military, serving as ambulance drivers and nurses at the front lines. By the end of the war, 47 Canadian nurses had lost their lives while on active duty. On the home front, women's efforts at volunteerism and paid labor on farms and in factories were held up as proof women deserve the same rights as men. Then, on the 28th of January in 1916, Manitoba became the first province to extend the franchise to women. It would just be a matter of time before Ontario followed suit. On February 15, 1917, two private members' bills supporting the women's vote were introduced in the Ontario Legislature. One of the bills was sponsored by John Wesley Johnson, a member of Premier William Hearst's own government. Upon second reading of the bills on February 27th, Premier Hearst rose to speak in the legislature. Suffragists who had filled the visitors' gallery listened with surprise as Sir William spoke in support of the Johnson Bill. Paying tribute to the war work of women, he said it was on this account he now believed women should be taken into partnership with men in the councils of the nation. The Ontario Franchise Act and the Ontario Elections Act both received royal assent and became law on the 12th of April, 1917. But there was still one obstacle left. Though women had won the right to vote, they could not yet be elected to sit as members of the legislature. It would be two more years and more debate before women could run for office with the passage of the Women's Assembly Qualifications Act on the 4th of April, 1919. Beginning that year, 26 women would run as candidates through seven provincial elections before Ray Lecoq and Agnes McPhail were finally elected in 1943. By then, Agnes McPhail was already well known. She had the distinction of being the first woman elected to the House of Commons in Ottawa. There, she represented the federal ridings of Grey Southeast and then Grey Bruce from 1921 to 1940. An advocate for adult education, free university tuition, and better access to education for rural people, she also supported state-funded daycare and prison reform. An ardent defender of women's rights, McPhail said, I want for myself what I want for other women, absolute equality. McPhail's final political success was the passage in 1951 of Ontario's first equal pay legislation, the Female Employees' Fair Remuneration Act. She had long lobbied for equal pay legislation, and despite limitations of the act that she herself criticized, it was a significant step forward in legislating equality for women in society. Ray Lecoq came from a political family. Her father, James J. Morrison, was a founder of the United Farmers of Ontario, the party that came to power in the 1919 Ontario election. She moved to Toronto when she married, and there she experienced both poverty and tragedy. Working as a milliner and seamstress, she lost her job, as did so many during the Depression years of the 30s. Then her daughter, Fern, died of complications from scarlet fever. She was only 12 years old. Following her daughter's tragic death, Lecoq became determined to represent the underprivileged and disadvantaged. Lecoq said that every human being of every color, race, or creed has an equal right to life, liberty, and happiness. As a member of the official opposition, Lecoq served as education critic. She supported equal pay for equal work, a wage for homemakers, 
and the right of women to stay on in the workplace after the war ended. An early environmentalist, she promoted reforestation and was critical of air pollution. Although she served only one term at the legislature, Ray Lecoq's career of activism continued. As president of the Housewives and Consumers Association, she organized a petition known as the March of a Million Names to protest the rising prices of food and household goods in the post-war years. A lifelong pacifist, Lecoq founded the Congress of Canadian Women and traveled as far as China to participate at international peace conferences. It would be 10 years and four elections in which 40 women stood as candidates before Ada Pritchard was elected in Hamilton Centre in 1963. Since that time, great inroads have been achieved by women. In 1992, Lynn McLeod became the first woman to lead a political party in Ontario. In 2009, Andrea Horvath became the first woman to lead the NDP. And in 2013, Kathleen Wynne was chosen to lead the Ontario Liberals, becoming Ontario's first female Premier, a post she kept upon her re-election in 2014. In that election, 38 women were elected, representing 35.5% of the seats in the legislature. The fight for universal suffrage did not end with women obtaining the right to vote in 1917. It was only in 1954 that all Indigenous persons, women included, finally received the full franchise in Ontario. The activism of the suffragists and other reformers raised awareness and brought about legislative changes over time that improved the political, legal and economic rights not only for all women, but for all the citizens of Ontario. My grandmother had been part of these women who wanted the right to vote and uh, certainly, you know, like had explained to me uh, the difference it makes to be able to speak for yourself the, and how important that is. When you look back to how influential, can you imagine a hundred years ago when women got the vote, how they influenced just what policies we have and what decisions government made. My grandmother, when my grandmother was born, she didn't have the right to vote and I was acutely aware of that. When my mom was born, she wasn't yet a person. We need to uphold the suffrage movement in the same way that we uphold the race, uh, the civil rights movement. We don't give it the same credence. We don't have a day off, you know, acknowledging women in politics. I brought a project to my constituency called Girls in Government and Leadership, where we do teach the girls about suffragists and we teach them about the fight for the right to vote. We also teach them that in other parts of the world, women aren't necessarily equal, and they do have to fight not only for their equality and, and, and education, but also for their freedom. From the moment I had uh, eligibility to vote, when the time I turned 18, I don't think I've missed a single election uh, in terms of voting. It's just something we were kind of raised with. Women have made a lot of progress in the last hundred years, certainly since they got the vote. And when you look back, and I can only look back 70 years, but when I look back and see where we are today, uh, I think that there's been significant changes in policy and acceptance in the political environment, uh, even though there are many, many challenges still to come.